Welcome to the Fortified Life Podcast, where we learn how to develop a dependency on Jesus in the marketplace. From the boardroom to the bathroom, God is with you. Here's our host, author, speaker, teacher, encourager, spiritual coach, and my husband, the man they call Mr. Fortified, Jason Davis. episode of the Fortified Life Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Davis, aka Mr. Fortify, and I'm always excited to be with you each and every single week with episodes from business owners, CEOs, best-selling authors, bringing you nuggets of wisdom for building a dependency on Jesus in the marketplace. And it's no different This week. In fact, uh, our guest this week is one of my uh, favorite authors with the the topics that he writes on. And uh, I look up to him quite a bit. And he has served uh, the community in so many different ways. Before I bring him on, let me introduce him to you. As a New York Times bestseller, Napoleon Hill Foundation certified trainer and professor, Dr. Kimbrough's experience is both broad and deep. Dr. Dennis Kimbrough is an educator, New York Times bestseller, bestselling author, and expert on leadership, wealth, and success. He is one of today's top business speakers. Dr. Dennis Kimbrough has documented and shared his principles and data-driven insight on peak performance with thousands of followers around the globe. With decades of experience as an academic researcher and a real-world practitioner of business, entrepreneurship, and leadership, Dr. Kimbrough has worked with dozens of clients to help them develop strategies to find solutions to complex business and organizational challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Fortified Life, Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. Dr. Kimbrough, how's it going? Jason, I'm doing well. That's quite an intro, my brother. I appreciate it. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. It's good to have you on the show. Well, Hey, it's um, good to be here. Yes, sir. You know, Dr. Kembro, uh, we speaking of your your bio, uh, you've been graced to to do a lot and, and serve for decades, uh, bringing uh, your data driven insight. Uh, but obviously, we know Dr. Kembro in 2023, you just didn't wake up and <laughs> and know everything you know <laughs> now. So, kind of take us back to the beginning and uh, chronicle your professional experience. Well, back to the beginning is a desire to answer two questions. Why does one person fail while another succeeds? And why is one individual rich and wealthy while another is impoverished? Mm. And after I finished my undergrad at University of Oklahoma, I was the first black male in the rotational program for Texas Instruments in Dallas, Texas, before becoming the first black male in the rotational program for Smith, Klein and French Pharmaceuticals. But between that, after I got my degree, me and my wife got married. We were seniors in college, undergrad. And um, I said to Pat, I said, I want to go ahead and finish this out and get my terminal degree. And so I got accepted to Northwestern University. And there I am about to finish my degree and arguably one of the best pieces of advice jason that i ever received was from a committee chairman on my dissertation committee and he said to me he said uh dennis don't look at this uh you know this task of finishing your dissertation as a requirement for your degree look at it view it as your first book Mm. so i was studying wealth and poverty in my London developed nation states And after I was granted the degree and got my doctorate, I turned to my wife and I said, I know exactly what I want to do. And she says, what is that? I said, well, you know how I studied wealth and poverty. She said, yeah, I don't. I said, I don't want to study poverty. I only want to study wealth. And you know how I was looking at nation states. I don't want to do that. I only want to study individuals. Well, the Lord tapped me on the shoulder because right after that, Two things occurred. Number one, I read a book called The Achieving Society by Thomas, uh, excuse me, by uh, David McClellan. Mm. And McClellan says in that book, Jason, said that every race, every group, every culture, every tribe, every ethnicity always has someone 
to go ahead, extrapolate the keys to success for future generations to come. And after I read that, and McClellan was not only a researcher, but he was a professor at Harvard for more than 25 years. And I read that and I said, okay, if that's true, where are the keys to success for black America? And the warning. And right after that occurred, <laughs> I said, okay. And so I was working in corporate America at the time. And um, they transferred me and my wife. I was being trained to be a district sales manager carrying the bag of pharmaceutical sales. Mm. And right after that, Jason, uh, I'm making a sales call. And I stumbled, and we know that there's no stumble. We know if you're going to, you know, you talk about the 45 life, there is no coincidence. There is no luck. Um, found a copy of an old, old, old time magazine that featured Martin Luther King mm. and said when Dr. King led the Montgomery bus boycott in 1958, there were only five black millionaires in the United States wow. and they li and they listed the five black millionaires. And uh, of course, one was John Johnson, Ebony magazine. One was SB Fuller up in Chicago with Johnson. The other one was AG Gaston in Birmingham, Alabama, TM Alexander right here in Atlanta, Georgia and Charles Clinton Spaulding, North Carolina mutual insurance company, in Raleigh Durham. It'll blow you away, Jason, but four out of the five were still living. Mm. And that's when I knew my calling. Wow. That's when I knew. I said, hey, this is a career shift. And so I sent out letters because there was no uh, collaborative tools back then. And I asked for interviews. Um, I interviewed them all except for Charles Clinton Spaulding. Um, I drove up to Raleigh Dorm from my Atlanta home and I interviewed uh, business partners of his, family members, and some of his employees trying to wrap my mind around who this individual was and how he got the dream and why it was so critically important. Mm. My goodness, Dr. Kimbrough, what a, what a journey. And uh, that quote, <laughs> I feel like a lot of times – uh, business owners, professionals, Dr. Kembro, like yourself, they have that, that moment, that turning point. Uh, how, how critical is it to, uh, be self-aware? Well, you, you read that in the book and then you knew like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. And Dr. Kembro, I know you've talked about this before, but there's a lot of people walking around like, man, I'm not really sure about my purpose and whatnot. So what was it about, that time that you knew, you know what, this is what I'm supposed to do and just give some wisdom to others on how they might be able to do the same. Well, the only reason why we're here is to share your gift mm -hmm. and a gift doesn't become a talent, Jason, until you use it. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a gift and I don't know what that gift is. You are the only one. So it goes back to mindset, soul set, heart set, health set. Now, you asked the question, how critical is that is, is self-awareness? Mm -hmm. Well, self-awareness will only occur if you take time to be centered. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, remember the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. What in the world does that mean? Well, if you're Christian, the Sabbath is Sunday. If you're Jewish, the Sabbath is Saturday. If you're Muslim, it's Friday. You look, you and I can travel the, uh, the entire globe, and I've damn near done that travel the entire globe and we might find you know a group a culture uh you know a cadre of people who say the sabbath is monday the sabbath is wednesday well the bottom line is jason the sabbath is every day mm -hmm. so when we say when we hear and we read remember the sabbath what does that what does that mean it takes that means take time out every day to be centered Take time out every day to refocus. Take time out every day to re-engineer, to recalibrate, to recenter. I mean, there's so much chaos and confusion going on, and you'll never hear it if you don't shut it down. Mm. So go to your prayer closet and close the door. Close the door to what? Close the door to your physical senses. Mm. I'm trying to speak to you. Why? 
because the, the ego shouts. <laughs> the ego shouts. Chaos, confusion. But the Holy Spirit whispers. Mm. And if if you're not in tune with the infinite, you're not going to hear it. Mm. You're not going to hear it. I had gone through a seven-year ordeal to finish what became Think and Grow Rich, a black choice. And we, me and my wife, we lost two cars in the process. You probably heard the story before. We lost two cars in the process, behind on our mortgage, going on, what, six months, half a year? And one day on a Sunday, it wasn't one day, but it was a Sunday, um, the mortgage company sent photographers out to take pictures of, of the property. And we just knew that we're about to be foreclosed on the mortgage. And my wife is crying. I'm crying. I felt forlorn. I felt no, I didn't feel like a failure, but it was close to it. I turned to my wife. I said, Pat, I, I did the best I could. Uh, hey, I fought the good fight. If this is it, this is it. And with her inimitable spirit, she said, we got to get out of the South. Enough with this pity party. We, we, we got to get out of here. And I said, where are we going? So we're going out to dinner. And I said, Pat, what do you mean we're going out to dinner? We don't have money. How are we going to get money to go out to dinner? <laughs> and she says, I'm going to write myself a check. Jason, you're a business owner. You know what that means. So <laughs> not proud of that moment. When you get to that moment, you tell me how you handle it. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to a, a local Chinese restaurant here in the Atlanta area. And after we were, cr I'm crying in my beer. I'm crying over my wonton and everything. And we're just, uh, you know, just talking and this, that, and everything. Well, after our meal, of course, they bring the fortune cookies. And we're cracking open the fortune cookie. She opens hers, and she reads it. And I said, oh, that's nice. And she said, now you open yours. So I opened up my fortune cookie, and I looked at it. And she said, what does it say? And I'm just shaking my head. And she says, what does it say? I said, Pat, this is not my fortune. What does it say? I said, no, it's not even worth reading. It's some nonsense. I said, but before I leave this restaurant, I'm going to find my fortune. And I went around to every table where patrons ate their dinner, left a fortune cookie, opened up a fortune cookie, left it, and blah, blah, blah. And it was causing quite a stir in the restaurant. She said, man, they're going to throw you out of here. What are you doing? I said, I'm looking for my fortune. I was, she's seated at the table and I'm clear across the other side of the restaurant yelling back to her. People are looking at me like I'm not. Well, I did find my fortune. Mm -hmm. You talk about self-aware. And I found it on a table clear across the restaurant. And I took that fortune and I scotch taped it on the first page of my Bible in my study. And here I am in my study, and you can look at it right now, and it said, you will be surrounded with warmth and riches. Mm. You don't know. What does the Bible say? Many are called, but few are chosen. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does that mean? Yeah, many are called, but only a handful updated the resume. Mm. Many are called, Jason, but only a couple, you know, wore business attire. Many are called. But only two or three showed up on time. I don't know. I don't know your level of belief. I don't know where you are in your life. But you've got a gift. Mamba mentality. That's not me. That's Kobe Bryant. Mm -hmm. But it won't become a talent until you use it. And if you don't believe me, go to Matthew and read the story. What are, oh, you got four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. you got four Gospels. And you can't read the Gospels as if you're reading a history book. What are you reading? You're reading individual testimonials. If you knew who walks beside you every day on this journey called life, you would never doubt or fear again. And, I mean, that's just one. It, and it applies to anybody. You don't have to be Christian to be uplifted by the holiest day in the Christian calendar, which is Easter Sunday. You don't have to be Muslim to be inspired by the holiest day on the Muslim calendar, which is Ramadan. 
Look, you you don't have to be Jewish to be uplifted by the holiest day on the Jewish calendar, which is Yom Kippur. Every group, every tribe, every culture. But you have to take the time out to refocus and be in tune with the infinite. Mm. So good, Dr. Kimbrough. So good. <laughs> you you mentioned that book, that critical time, Thinking Grow Rich, a Black Choice. Can you talk about Dr. Kimbrough, um, the relationship with Napoleon Hill and his organization to, uh, as you were walking into your purpose, but really beginning to shape that message and the data for the African American community? Talk about that um, and how that really shaped the, quite frankly, uh, quite a bit of the rest of your research. Yes. And again, there, there is no coincidence. And this is a great example of how, you know, game changing peak performing individuals think. Mm -hmm. What what does the Bible say? The Bible says it's called righteousness. And what is righteousness? Nine times out of 10, we don't even know. We can well sanctify. It ain't got nothing to do with that. Righteousness, righteousness, Jason, means right use of your mind. And so here I am, and I just flew back. I spent time with Earl Graves, the publisher of Black Enterprise magazine, and it took me close to three years just to get that interview with him. And so I I flew back, and I get home, and my wife said, you better look at your answering machine. Somebody just keeps calling you and calling you and calling you. Well, I had... When I started out on this task, I wrote 50 names on a sheet of paper of peak performing individuals, all African-American. They didn't know me, but I certainly knew them, and I was going to set about the interview. So I wrote down 50, and I interviewed game changers. I wrote another 50, went out, and I interviewed them, quick counting at 150 interviews. Well, and you have to wrap your mind around this. This was in the 1980s. I mean, every, everybody is a speaker and this, that, and everything today. Well, there, w- there was none of that then. And I tell folks all the time that the public speaking didn't drive me. What drove me is to finish this book for future generations to come. Mm. And so um, I wrote a couple of articles because word got around that, hey, man, I was interviewing Game Changers and they were giving me the keys to success. And, you know, some magazines were asking for articles and this, that and everything. So Success Magazine was one of those magazines. And at the time, the executive uh, executive, excuse me, the executive editor was a gentleman by the name of Scott DeGarmo. So he approached me and he says, uh, he says, Dennis, can you can you write us a series of articles? Because we don't have any on black sales and black entrepreneurs and to show you how naive I was at the time, uh, I, I gave him my manuscript. And I said, here, take the manuscript. Take anything out of your No, no, no. We like your writing style. We want you to write it specifically for us. So I did. So I wrote a series of articles. And I didn't know it, Jason, but one of the articles made it to the desk of W. Clement Stone, who was Napoleon Hill's business partner at the time. Wow, And he was one of the wealthiest individuals in the world, certainly here in the United States. So I flew back, get back home. My wife says, man, check your answering machine. And so I hit the button. And who was it? It was W. Clement Stone. Young man, we heard about you. When can you come to Chicago? I would like to meet you. The next day I returned his phone call. Didn't have the slightest idea what he had in mind. Less than two weeks later, Me and my wife are in Chicago. She's waiting in the rental car that we got at O'Hare Airport, November 3rd, 1986. (laughs) And I walk into Napoleon Hill, well, W. Clement Stone's palatial office, outskirts of Chicago, walk into his office. He's surrounded by his lieutenant's palatial office. And he said, young man, we got a proposition for you. And I said, what is that, Mr. Stone? And he said, we want you to finish, update a book. And I said, what book? And at that point, he reached across his credenza, pulled out the last 100 pages that Napoleon Hill ever wrote. 
Wow. Wow. Man. He was working on a black version of his all time classic Think and Grow Rich. Now, here you are in my study, and I can go over there and pull out the last 100 written pages from his Hamilton typewriter. So here we are in Southwest of Cab, outskirts of Atlanta, Georgia. And the working title was Blacks Are Growing Rich. Mm. He had four, um, not actually interviews because he didn't get a chance to interview him, but four profiles in there. And here's the, uh, and it's really not ironic, Jason. I had interviewed these individuals. <laughs> I had the actual interviews. And again, remember I told you that TM Alexander was one of the five black millionaires? Mm hmm. Well, I spent a half a day with T.M. Alexander right here in Atlanta. Mm. I spent a half day with A.G. Gaston. I drove over to Birmingham, Alabama. So the folks that he would profile, I had the actual interviews. Mm. Now, Hill, if Hill would have lived one year longer, this would have been his 17th book. Mm, okay. Now, what I'm telling you is critically important. This is his last book. Now, the reason why I share that, because you got so many different adaptations of Hill's writings, but they weren't his books. This, Think and Grow Rich, a black choice, is Napoleon Hill's last book. Mm. Now, why do I share that? Because you got a Think and Grow Rich, a women's choice out there. It's not his book. It's an adaptation of his book. You got Think and Grow Rich, a Hispanic choice out there. This was the last book that he was working on. He died of a stroke in November. Um, and at the time of his death, this was the book that he was working on. Mm. Wow. Like you said, Dr. Kimbrough, no coincidences. <laughs> no. None at all. None mm -mm. at all. And I, I love the fact that who he had set out to interview, you had already spent time <laughs> with those yeah. individuals. So everything was coming together. Now, Dr. Kimbrough, the significance of that being his last book, like you said, there's many adaptations, but this was his last book. You go mm -hmm. on and you, and you finish it, and then things really get in motion uh, with the research. What at that time, Dr. Kimmerer, that you recall, once it was written and then these conversations start being had, how did you see the conversation shift around black wealth? Uh, that's a great question because my students say to me all the time, Dr. Kimmerer, man, you write all these books about money and wealth, but your books don't have anything to do with money. And I said, you're exactly right. <laughs> it's got everything to do with values. Mm. And this generation now, it's all about chasing the bag. Mm -hmm. You know, Jason, this game that we call life. And if I have found anything from the countless interviews and the writing and the research and being spiritually connected, there are only five rules to this. And we get sidetracked, we lose our focus, and this is unlike, again, I share this with my students, if you knew who walks beside you every day on this journey called life, you would never doubt or fear again in your life. Well, number one, this, this life is a game, but unlike any game, Jason, it's not played on a field. Mm -hmm. No, it's played in your mind. And there are five key rules. Rule number one, there are no opponents. You are the only opponent. You are the only individual playing this game and playing in your mind. And the number one goal is awareness. You mentioned it, being spiritually aware. Awareness. Because if you're not aware, the first thing you say, well, I got to change. I want to I want to change my life and change. The last thing in the world you need is change. Mm. Why would you change? You don't need to change. You need to be spiritually aware. You were created out of perfection. Why would you change from perfection? You have every tool that you want. Why would you change three times? 
That coffin from gallery asked the blind man, do you see? Three times he asked him. And why did he ask him three times? Because the blind man thought that he sees with his eyes and Jesus was trying to tell him, you don't see with your eyes. You see through your eyes. You can only see what you're spiritually conscious of seeing. There I am in Baltimore, Ohio. And here I am interviewing a gentleman by the name of Henry Parks. To all your listeners out there, go Google Henry Parks, Sparks Sausage. And I flew up to Baltimore, and I'm again having another one of my pity parties because of the financial strain that I'm, that I'm under writing this thing. And he says to me, he says, young man, what is wrong? And I tell him everything going on in my life, blah, blah, blah. And he shared the the, the He shared the following anecdote. He said, young man, in one hand, I have a dream. In another hand, I have an obstacle. Which one grabs your attention? And my mind goes back. You only see what you're, you know, spiritually in tune to see. Rule number two, as a man or as a woman thinketh. So is he or she. As a man, as a woman thinketh. You know, so so what are you thinking? Do you take time to think? You know, we're in a society now with social media and we lose the number one reason why these individuals came up with these social media platforms. When Zuckerberg came up with Facebook, when Jack Dorsey came up with Twitter, when Reed Hoffman came up with LinkedIn, when Evan, you know, when uh, Evan Spiegel came up with Snapchat, on and on and on and on. They didn't come up with these social media platforms for you and I to gossip. They came up with these social media platforms. So somebody might be, you know, uh, might be motivated to go ahead and buy this schoolgirl in in Johannesburg, South Africa, a uniform so she can go to school. Mm -hmm. They came up with these social media platforms, Jason. You might be motivated to go to Bangladesh and dig a well so somebody might have adequate drinking water. And what do we do? As an individual thinking, what what is rule number three? You don't make money your goal. You don't make money your goal. Your goal is take the wise, productive use of your money. So what does that mean? I don't care if you make $10,000 a year or $10 million a year. Mm. Under that mindset, you're wealthy. You're wealthy. There are 195 countries throughout the globe. All but 30 belong to the United Nations. Of the 165 that belong to the United Nations, these are what we call advanced democratic societies. Mm. So what does that have to do with you? Well, when you look at the advanced democratic societies, in terms of wealth, Black America is number 16. Black America is number 16 in the United Nations in terms of wealth. But you would never know it. Uh You would never know it. Why? Because half of my race, when we get up in the morning, we are in survival mode only. Uh Just get through this day. That's my goal. Just connect these dots for the next 24 hours by any means necessary. Now, this is a spiritually based podcast. That was the same mindset that Moses was trying to tell the Israelites when they were, quote unquote, trapped up against the Red Sea. Mm. And they said, Moses, you led us out of the desert and now you're going to drown us. And Moses said, because he knew he was spiritually aware what the Lord of heavenly hosts said to him. Why dost thou criest unto me? In other words, you've seen 50 million miracles that the Lord of heavenly hosts performed. You saw, you know, the power that you have back in Egypt. Why are you crying unto me? So black America, you're number 16th in terms of wealth, but you're not spiritually where you think it's all about the bag when it's the productive use of your money. Rule number four, easy. You want to change your position? You want to change where you are in life? Well, it begins with attitude. Uh 
A change in your attitude will change your position. I show my students a picture of LeBron James basketball, and he's going up on Kyrie Irving. And Kyrie Irving's playing defense, and LeBron James is on his way to the basket, and the last second, LeBron James pivots. What's a pivot? What in God's name is a pivot? A pivot is maintaining your overall strategy but altering your immediate tactics. Mm. So you got 500 Fortune 500 companies right now. Uh, Number one might be Amazon. Number one might be Walmart. Number one might be Facebook, blah, blah, blah. Number five, excuse me, number 500 might be Big Lots. 500 Fortune 500 companies. And on the way from inception to making that Fortune 500 list, all of them, pivoted at least two times. Mm. If you're a basketball player and you only got one move, you ain't going to be in the NBA. Got to learn to pivot. So you're you're telling me you're spiritually aware? Well, you know when you get up the rock in a hard place, change your attitude. Change your attitude. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David wrote that psalm before he fought Goliath, not after. Not have to change your attitude. An attitude will make or break an organization, an enterprise, a church, a group. (laughs) An attitude is that one string that you can play day in and day out. It's the one note. And what do we know about a note? (laughs) It's the silence between the notes that makes the music. It's the space between the bars, Jason, that confines the tiger. Change your attitude. And then last but last last but not certainly least, we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. Why? Because faith is the evidence. What do we mean by evidence? All right, so your house was broken into. You call the police. The detectives are there. What do the police tell you, Jason? Don't touch anything till we dust for fingerprints. So they dust for fingerprints, and they take the fingerprints against their database, and they call you up, and they say, Jason, we found who was the culprit. We got him. And they take him to court. They say, here it is right here. Here's the fingerprints. This is evidence. This is proof that, you know, you broke into Jason's house, blah, blah, blah. All right. So here you are. No one in your family has ever generated wealth. No one in your family knows anything about money. You've been broke your entire life. But you tell your closest friends that in 60 months, you're going to generate an income, blah, blah, blah. And what do they do? They steal your dream. Jason, you out of your mind. Jason, that'll never happen. No, it will happen. Jason, prove it to me. That'll happen. I have faith. That's the evidence. That's the evidence. Faith dusted for the fingerprints. Here it is. Here's the proof that you were looking for. My faith. Mm. That's what that that's evidence. Yeah, I have I have the faith. And when you have that type of faith. In every area of your life, Jason, you called me up and you said this is spiritually driven podcast. Well, that'll give you the peace that passes all understanding. That passes all understanding. See, that's what Nelson Mandela had 27 years. He was on that rock. He had the peace that passes all understanding. Why? All the bank robbers, all the murderers, all the uh, folks that molested women were on that rock. And they said to him, said, Nelson, why don't you smile so much? And you don't belong here on Robin Island. We murdered people. We stole from people. We're the individuals that belong here. All you did, Nelson, was stand up to the South African government and said apartheid is illegal and immoral. But you're the one who's always smiling. That's why do you smile so much? He had the peace that passes all understanding. The first hour of the day, Nelson Mandela called it his golden hour. Why? 
He would walk for one hour to get in tune with the infinite. Wow. That's what is what did Gandhi say? Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jew, doesn't matter who you pray to, as long as the Almighty and Creator is being praised. What did, what did Martin Luther King say, man? He said, what is the greatest love in the world? The greatest love in the world is not between me and some young child. The greatest love in the world is not between an adult and, a, you know, uh, an adolescence. The greatest love in the world is not between parent and son, parent and daughter. The greatest love in the world is between an adult and a child clear across the other side of the globe. Mm. So that's the beloved community. Three times Martin Luther King was compelled to give up the nonviolent movement. Three times. Number one, when Megar Evers was shot in his driveway. Number two, 1963, when those four little girls were bombed in that church. And then last but not least, his impending assassination, because he could feel it. And each time he got to that point, he called his lieutenants together, called them in the room, and said, fellas, Let's discuss the principles. Let's discuss the principles. Well, you have the principle, and there's basically only two. If I took a glass of water into a chemistry class and I assayed down to its finest components, I get two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. If I took the Bible into that same chemistry class and I assayed down all 60-some-odd books, Four Gospels, all written by 40 authors. What would I get? Only get two principles. Number one, be not afraid. And number two, what Deion Sanders tells his players, believe. Mm. What in vogue, what in vogue told Destiny's Child, particularly Beyonce, at the lowest point in her life when they didn't even think that they were going to get a record label. What did in vogue tell Beyonce? believe what is sister sledge telling vogue believe and what am i telling your listeners right now believe believe wow so good Dr. Kembro, uh, for all the listeners out there, I bet you didn't know you were going to get a combination of a sermon and a keynote <laughs> on this week's show. And Dr. Kembro, we could go uh, another three hours, but we know we're limited by our time. Uh, Dr. Kembro, you speak with such uh, passion. Uh, I know that you take time out to think, as you said. What are you most excited about for the upcoming year in 2024? Well, uh, I'm excited about uh, a number of items. Uh, I've, I've got my goals. I've got my why. Um, I review them constantly. And they're, I mean, the curtain is coming up on this, you know, this life drama every day. I'm excited about my relationship with the Almighty, getting closer, diving into the world, knowing why I am really here. Um, I'm excited about, um, you know, my family and the role that I play. But um, just being spiritually aware, just being spiritually aware gets me up in the morning and it keeps me up at night and if i can just continue to make a difference and you've you've heard me say it before jason that's that's only the thing that you want to do number one you want to make a difference number two you want to make a difference with someone else who wants to make a difference number three you want to make a difference with someone else who wants to make a difference doing something that makes a difference but number four, you want to make a difference with somebody else who wants to make a difference doing something that makes a difference at a time when it makes all the difference in the world. And this is the time. People ask, well, why do we need Black Lives Matter in 2023? Because for close to 400 years, you acted as this Black Lives didn't matter for 400 years. So we're making this difference. 
Jason, my brother, you could have had anybody on your podcast. I hope you rip it out the frame. Thanks for having me on. I'm eternally grateful for this opportunity. Absolutely, Dr. Kimbrough. It was a pleasure to have you as well. Uh, Dr. Kimbrough, where can listeners go to uh, find all your books, uh, where you'll be speaking next, and follow you on social media? Where can they find that? Well, you can go anywhere. Go to your local bookstore. <laughs> go to your local black bookstore. Go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Those bad boys have a life of their own, man. A life of their own. If I could just tell you, I teach at Clark Atlanta, folks that may come up on the AUC, they want to see Stoneman, they want to see Morehouse, they want to see CAU, and they go to the bookstore. And the first thing the bookstore, the folks in the book said, well, you know, he teaches. Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah. As a matter of fact, he's in class right now. Bum rush my class. Can you sign my book? I'm in the middle of class, but can you sign my book? So you can get those bad boys anywhere. In terms of social media, I am on all the platforms. I've got, I got to give a huge shout out to my team. I have an excellent team in South Florida. I love those guys and I love Miss G so much. They are, they are really handling me and they got me out there, bro. So in terms of social media, I'm everywhere. And then your last question that's a good question. Um, I will be in uh, Miami. Um, uh, I'll be in London first of the year. i got to think of my schedule. I will be all over. So <laughs> there you are with the important thing. I am with you, Jason, right now, my brother. Stay yes. strong. Yes. Sir, Stay strong. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate that, Dr. Kembro. And folks, don't you worry. We will have in the show notes uh, links where you can find all the information for Dr. Kembro, his website, social media links, as well as his books. Please get his books. He mentioned one of them, Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice. He's got several and also one of my personal favorites, The Wealth Choice, Success <laughs> Secrets of Black Millionaires. I, I read that one recently within the past year and that I know there, I love all of them, Dr. Kimber, but that one is oh. probably my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for the shout out, my brother. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, folks, uh, that's all we've got time for. Uh, Dr. Kembro's got to continue uh, spreading the, the knowledge and the message. So we're going to let him go. But you know how we end things on the podcast. Don't compartmentalize your faith in the marketplace. And from the boardroom to the bathroom, God is with you. We'll see you next time on the Fortified Life podcast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Fortified Life Podcast. You can catch us live on Wednesdays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time and on demand. Check out FortifiedLifePodcast.com for more details. To learn how to live out your faith in the marketplace, grab a copy of Jason Davis's book, Fortify, Being Rooted in God's Plan for Work and Business, available on Amazon.